Jesus, we don't want to be lukewarm. Amen? Because lukewarm isn't great. Not great at all. And, and so to be, to be passionate, I just I love that. Um, <laughs> how how uh, Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. Some of you know the story. And uh, there are some people that are pretty excited about him being king over their lives. And the disciples were all excited. They were jumping up and down. They were dancing, singing Hosanna. They were waving, like doing this, and you know, break dancing maybe even before break dancing was a thing. You know, and the Pharisees, the religious dudes of the day, were going, Man, this is not appropriate. This is not cool. This is not kosher. This is not acceptable. And they, <laughs> they tell Jesus, they go, hey, Jesus, tell your disciples to settle down, to stop carrying on like they are. And Jesus turns to them and says, man, if they don't, the rocks will. If they don't, the rocks will. And I just want to be a part of a church that does not get outpraised by rocks. Amen? Yeah, so, some of you are with me on this. And so this, this is good. I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad we're all back. We're glad, glad we're back. Are you, are you glad you're back? We're back, gang. We're back. You're back. I'm back. I, I love this. And here's, here's what I need you to do. Can you do me a favor and turn to a person either side of you, look them right in the eye, and, and just ask them this question. Do you have it? Be careful how you say that, but just do that. Okay, just... Just, do you have it? It. Go ahead. Just go ahead. Do you have it? Do, it. do you, you got it? You, do you have it? Do you have it? Jalen, you got it? <laughs> because either you have it or you don't. And some have it and some don't. Uh, most people I meet these days want it, but few have it. Maybe some of you had it but you lost it, but you want it again. It is outside the box. It is powerful. It is life-giving. It is life-changing. It has its critics. It can be controversial. People misunderstand it. It's hard to find, but it's impossible to miss it. You're probably asking by now, Pastor Brad, what is it. To be honest with you, I'm not sure. <laughs> I have little clue, but not much of one. I don't know for sure. Defining it, understanding it, would be like trying to chase or harness the wind. Uh, trying to contain or even explain oxygen. You know it when you feel it and when you experience it. And it's what Jesus has been teaching me this past season in my soul. You see, he's been teaching me how to breathe again. And to have it. And it's not that I've lacked it. Maybe I'm just in this season in my soul where I want it more. And in fact, to be honest with you, I need it more. Now, for those of you that have been around church circles, you, and if you stick around here long enough, you're going to understand that it is not an it, it's a who. The it that I'm talking about is this third person of the Trinity that we have understood from past eternity, from all the revelation that's come to us, as the Holy Spirit. Yeah. It. Let's go. And what Jesus has been teaching me about the Holy Spirit is that this was his plan from all along. Uh, there's a song by, uh, what's that guy who's, uh, you know, the Blake guy. What, what's his, uh, you know, the, sorry, buddy. Um, oh, just, uh, I lost him. You know, he, 
Come on, help me out here. He's just Brand, Brandon. Oh, sorry, buddy. Brandon, thank. Yeah, I, I see. Brand, Brandon Lake. Okay, so he, he had this song, and uh, been singing it. And, 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 and there's a line, and it. it says, "It's not a building you want to fill. It's my heart. This empty place. It's what you wanted all along." You see, Jesus isn't looking to fill buildings or atmospheres or places. Now, he can do that if he wants to, gang. But you know what he really wants to fill? Our hearts. It's what I call the divine conspiracy. That Jesus did not come to take sides. He did not come to establish another religion. You know what he came to do? He came to take over. And the way he takes over is when he fills a human being's heart with all his fullness. <laughs> oh. And you know, I've been reading the Bible like Pastor Drew tells me to. <laughs> 15 minutes a day, gang. If you're around here, you know, you're going to hear 15 minutes a day. You're doing your 15 minutes a day? Some of you, I can tell you're doing your 15 minutes a day. Others of you, I can tell you're not. <laughs> so do your 15 minutes a day. It's a breakfast of champions. Yeah. It's your wheeze for your soul. So I'm looking at this. This is crazy. So I'm hanging out, kind of doing my readings. And do you know that if you go all the way back to, to the book of Genesis, you see that this was God's heart all along. You know that poem of creation we know as the book, the first book of the Bible, Genesis? It says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, Then the Lord God formed a man from a speck of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Someone say life. And the man became a living being. You see, the two are connected pretty crazy, that God took a speck of dust, breathed his breath into that person, and at that moment, they became alive. They weren't alive before that. Spiritually speaking, they were not. God had to breathe. It's really interesting that this word in Hebrew, ruha, meaning breath, and panuma in the Greek, Literally translated means spirit. God breathed, not his breath, but his spirit into humanity. That's what he wanted all along. For us to be filled with his spirit. Crazy thought. So he goes along and then later on, again, same chapter. God says and commanded the man, you are free to eat any tree of the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You need to trust me for that. I'll show you by my spirit living in you what's good and what isn't. But the moment you try to find goodness in life outside of a relationship with me, you're going to die. What's going to happen? The spirit in you is going to evaporate. It's going to go. And what's amazing about this is that's exactly what happened. And from then on, God set in motion his plan to figure out how to get the spirit, his spirit, back in us. Because we had disqualified ourselves from carrying around in our temples the Holy Spirit. Because we sinned. We broke covenant and trust with a holy God. And the only people that God can have fellowship with, because he's holy, are holy people. And some of you are going, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. Hang on, we'll get to this in a second. But hang in that tension for a second, just so that you understand the heart of God. But he set in motion throughout the entire Bible. You can, you can read it. Joel, the prophet Joel said, in the latter days, God's going to pour out his spirit on who? All flesh. All of us. I go, what? Yeah, it's coming. Ezekiel says in Ezekiel 36 that God is going to put his very spirit in us. This is crazy. 
He's going to do this. And you know, so again, I've been reading through the Bible and Pastor Drew, we, he challenged us. Some of you were in on this back in January where we did 30 day shred. Some of you remember where we read the Bible, the entire Bible from beginning to end in 30 days. It was crazy. It was nuts. We, we didn't get all of it, but we got a lot of it. Because the goal was never to get all the way through the Bible. It was to get Jesus of the Bible all the way through us. And that's why we call you to this, gang. Because the scriptures are actually God breathed. And when you avail yourself to the scriptures, you know what you're availing yourself to? The very breath of God. But when you don't, what are you breathing in? Oh, so, so I, I get to the gospel of John. This is fun. Are you still with me, gang? Are you still with me? Because it's really quiet. Yeah, okay. All right. So, so I get to the gospel of John, and it's so cool because you start to recognize patterns as you read. If you guys do this, right? It, and you don't have to be a pastor to do this. You all of a sudden, whoa, because it's the Holy Spirit that's actually leading you and teaching you and revealing things to you. And, and you go, whoa, that's so super cool and natural. And so I get to the Gospel of John, and does anybody remember how the Gospel of John begins? Yeah, yeah, in the beginning. Hey, hold on. Where have we heard that before? Gen Gen Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then in John, John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and nothing that had been created has been created apart from him. In him was life. And that life was the light of man. And the darkness hasn't comprehended it, hasn't overcome it, because it's light. <laughs> so John, I love John. I love John because he, he's actually pointing to something. He's going, well, hold on here. So in the beginning, and he's paralyzed, par paralleling in the beginning with his gospel, and I go, whoa. What's happening here? This is crazy. And then he starts to introduce us to the light of the world, the Lamb of God. And, and as he's doing this, he starts to give us signs, almost like days, signs, that who's come to us is not just Jesus, <laughs> but he's the Son of God. And, and he's the one that created all of us. And all of it, and, and this is what's crazy, is that the very first sign that Jesus performs is at a wedding. Anybody remember what it was? Do you remember? You remember what Jesus did? Remember he turned water into grape juice? Whiskey. Oh, no. I thought it was, I thought it was wine. No, it wasn't, it wasn't grape juice, right? It was, it was actually wine. And remember that one? Gang, who would have loved to have been at that wedding? Hmm. It just got getting going. And then the second sign that John marks, he goes, oh, no. But then there's a, an official son that Jesus heals. And then he gives another sign. And, and he says, it's, it's the healing of the guy, the paralytic, by the pool of Bethsaida. Remember when Pastor Drew was like, like stepping over pew, like seats and stuff like that? Remember? I mean, he was just trying to get to that. And that's the third sign. And then there's the feeding of the 5,000. And, and then the, the sixth sign is... Jesus walks on the water. And then the seventh sign, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Hey, so in the beginning, God created, how many days did it take for God to create? Come on, seven. John starts, in the beginning was the word, and now he gives seven signs, seven Days of a new creation. So you see, Jesus is doing something new. Our creator has come to renew us. And so you get into it, but, but, but that only leaves us to John 11. But we have still the crucifixion and the eighth sign that Jesus gives that we celebrate at Easter, which is his resurrection. Hold on here. There were only seven days of creation originally. 
Jesus shows up and he does the seven days of creation, but he does an eighth one in order to signal to his church, to his followers, he is doing a brand new thing that he is making all things new. And if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. An eighth day is the first day of the new creation. He is the firstborn from the dead. And in John 20, gang, don't miss this. This is so good. Listen to this. This is what he wanted for all along. Not a building to be filled, but our hearts. Look at our creator coming for us, our savior, our king, renewing us. And what does he do? This is his disciples after resurrection. And in John 20, 22, it says this. And with that, with the fact that he'd been raised from the dead, the eighth sign, the first day of the new creation, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. I go. Uh, A.W. Tozer. A.W. Tozer was a spokesperson for Jesus a generation or two ago. You know what he said? He said, you know what? If you took the Holy Spirit out of 95% of churches in North America today, there'd be no noticeable difference. I, I take it a little further. If you were to take the Holy Spirit out of 95% of Jesus, professing Jesus followers and families in North America today, there'd be no noticeable difference. It'd just be business as usual. And gang, I'm broken over that. I'm absolutely broken over that. Question, really, honest? Can, can I be honest? Because I've been asking me, myself this question. If the... <laughs> If the Holy Spirit was taken out of your life today, would there be any noticeable difference with today versus tomorrow? Would there be? Because I wonder. I, I, I wonder about this. I, because shouldn't there be? Gang, shouldn't there be? Like, if, if this was what God wanted all along, shouldn't there be a noticeable difference for those that are filled with the Spirit of God and those that aren't? Like, a noticeable difference. Obvious difference. Because the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is living in us. Here's, here's the deal. I think, I think we live too small of a Christian life, gang. We don't need the Holy Spirit. That's what I see. Our visions are way too small. We don't need them. And so it's no noticeable difference. Jesus says, and I'm just doing some tea. Like these are his words, not mine, gang. He says this. He says, in John 16, verse 7, but very truly I tell you, it is better. Someone say better. It is better for you that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the Spirit will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. It is better. <laughs> it's better. We go, really? It's better? <laughs> How does this get better than Jesus be, being in the flesh? Come on, come on just, go, just go with me on this for a second. Could you imagine that you had Jesus beside you 24-7. Physically. He'd be with you 24-7. Hey, how would your thought life change? Hey, would that make a difference? How about some besetting sin? You know those sins that keep tripping you up? Maybe some addictions. If Jesus were right with you, right there, 24-7, when you were tempted, would that make a difference, gang? <laughs> I think my wife would love that, you know? Because I think I would be much 
more of a loving, considerate, selfless husband. I do. If Jesus was right there, and yet he, he says, not me. It's going to get better. This is better. Okay, okay, go, go with me on this. Okay, just, just let's say Austin Matthews. Some of you know Austin Matthews? Yeah, he got a little promotion over the summer, I hear. Come on, I know. I know, let's just say that Austin Matthews, the captain of the, the Toronto Maple Leafs, were to phone, easy, easy. <laughs> let's just say he phoned up Pastor Drew and said, Drew, hey, listen, buddy. I know you, have, you love hockey. I uh, know you play in that beer league. And uh, you're, you're almost getting to the point where you're winning the scoring championship. But I want to give you, uh, just throw you a bone here. I'm going to invite you to come. Hang out with me for a weekend. We're going to run some drills, work on some skills. And Pastor Drew, no kidding, gets the opportunity for a weekend to hang out with Austin Matthews. Working on a shot, his skating, his passing, his hockey sense. Not that he needs much of that, but okay. Now, if he comes back and he plays at the same level or even worse than when he was with Austin Matthews, you'd be going, well, you'd never know that. You'd never know that Pastor Drew. Now, let's just say Austin Matthews said, now, here's the deal. You need a lot of work. So I'm going to invite you for the next three years to follow me around arena to arena. Pastor Drew, though, he would never, you know, in any way abandon his family. But he would just say, I'm going to rearrange things in such a way that I'm going to be with Austin Matthews every single day. And he's going to teach me the tricks of the trade. Now, after three years, do you think that Pastor Drew would be any better of a hockey player? Come on, let's hear it. Hey, okay, buddy, you got about half thinking you're, you're going to be better. <laughs> maybe, 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 that's why. But now all of a sudden, if, if you could imagine that Austin Matthews somehow, some way, could capture his DNA, his spirit, and put it in Pastor Drew. You think there'd be any noticeable difference on the hockey? Absolutely. Gang, Jesus said this, it's better. It's better for me to go so I can send my spirit into my followers to live the life that I lived when I was in the flesh. You see, Christianity is impossible apart from the Holy Spirit in your life. You cannot follow Jesus in your own strength. And if you are, you're not following Jesus. You know what you're doing? You're asking him to follow you. And newsflash, he doesn't. He follows you with goodness and mercy because that's who he is. But he is not allowing you to call the shots in his life. Because if you are, you know what you're doing? You're grieving and quenching the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't want to go, just go with me on this. Just, just consider this. Some people ask me as a pastor, Pastor, pastor Brad, I, th I think I have, have created or I've actually committed the unforgivable sin. Because the Bible talks about an unforgivable sin. Anybody know what the unforgivable sin is? Who, say, say it again. It's unbelief. It's basically you know, what, what Jalen said too. Denying the power of the Holy Spirit. Because you know the, the power of the Holy Spirit? You know what the Holy Spirit's responsibility, main ministry is to you? Is to show you the worth of Jesus. He does not testify on his, on his own behalf. He testifies about who Jesus is. And when we grieve and quench the Holy Spirit and do not follow him or allow ourselves to be filled with him, that we allow idols and other priorities to take the place of him, 
You know what it does? It's calling him a liar. Jesus isn't worth my best. He's not worth my all. And in that moment, it's unforgivable. I don't get it, gang. I don't get it. That when we grieve and quench the Holy Spirit, it's absolutely unforgivable. Why? Because we're grieving and quenching the Holy Spirit. Unforgivable. And we live in a state of unforgiveness. And it breaks our Father's heart. This is crazy. Do you know why Jesus died on the cross? And I'll wrap up with this. Let me just see what I, what I got time here. What I got. Yeah. The reason why Jesus died on the cross was to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Why? Why? There was a reason for that. It was because he wanted to qualify you again to be vessels, holy temples for him to put his Holy Spirit in. And when we do whatever we want to do with our temples, with whoever we want, whenever we want, you know what it does? It grieves the Holy Spirit if you're a Jesus follower. And listen, if you're not, I want to just tell you that if you ever become a follower of Jesus where you see his worth, the Holy Spirit goes, you've done it enough on your own. You're living a nice, small, maybe comfortable life or maybe a broken life. And he's saying, come on, come and follow me. And I'm going to do something amazing in you. I'm going to cleanse you from your sin so that you become holy vessels as we've been singing about, as we've been learning about. And God says, you be holy. Why? Because I'm holy and I've put my spirit in you. Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit? That you were not bought with perishable things like silver and gold, but you were bought with the precious blood of Jesus so he could put his spirit in you, gang. And some of you are missing out on it. You're living small lives. You got sin in your life that you're not repenting from. You're just fooling around with it. And you're grieving the Holy Spirit. And I go, I don't want anybody a part of our family, our exchange family, quenching or grieving the spirit of the living God. Just think about that. The living God, the almighty, strong, and holy, did everything. So not only would he walk with us, but it's better because he lives right in us. The apostle Peter, remember him? <laughs> I think we talked about him. I think Pastor Drew talked about him. Remember his denial? <laughs> remember he couldn't profess his savior, his Lord, his friend. Remember he couldn't stand by Jesus. He denied him three times. That was when Jesus was right beside him. And 40 days later, after Jesus walks the earth in his resurrected form, he says to his disciples, please wait in a prayer meeting. That's why we pray as a church, because we need the Holy Spirit. Prayer is the way we show God and demonstrate our dependency upon the Holy Spirit is on our knees. It's how the church started. It's how it advances. It will continue to advance on its knees. This is what's cool. <laughs> that Jesus shows up, pours out his spirit on his disciples, and Peter, Peter, the one who denied him, all of a sudden, where's Jesus? He's gone, he's gone to heaven, he's not beside Peter. But what does Peter have, gang? He has what's better. He has the Holy Spirit in him. And so some of you are going, well, how do I get the Holy Spirit? Well, thanks for asking, he says that in Acts chapter two. And we're going to celebrate it next weekend with baptism. You see, Peter stood up and he said, Hey, men of Judah and Jerusalem, you killed Jesus. You killed him. 
but God raised into life. Say your story. There was such boldness and conviction by the Holy Spirit in him that people were cut to the heart. This was a spirit thing. And they said, what are we gonna do? What must we do? And Peter says, repent. Repent and be baptized, every single one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. Wow, why? Because that's how God cleanses us and qualifies us to be containers of his Holy Spirit. And you too, he says, will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit because this is for you. Someone say you. Is there a you in the house? Anybody need some more of the Holy Spirit in them? Yeah, I love the hands, I love you guys. <laughs> he said, this promise is for you. Do not let anything allow you to rip you off of your promise. This promise is for you and your kids, he says. Oh, don't get me going. You see, our kids don't get the Holy Spirit because oftentimes parents and grandparents don't have them. But this gift of the Holy Spirit comes through us relationally to the next generation. Because if they're not impressed by the Holy Spirit, you know they're gonna be impressed by the world. And we're gonna give them the world, gang, when we're not following the Spirit, we're gonna give them the world and they're gonna lose their souls because we haven't given them the Spirit. Oh man, you guys still with me? Yeah, you still wanna carry my picture around in your back pocket? Yeah, yeah, that's okay, that's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm growing out of that. but I don't even know how to wrap this up. But we need to. I mean, here's what I want, want you to do. Would you just stand with me in honor of Jesus who wants to pour his spirit out on us? And maybe, maybe if you're hungry and desperate like I am for more of it or more of the spirit. You just want to raise your hand. I just want to ask you a question. What are you doing right now in your life that you would not be doing apart from the spirit of God in your life? What are you doing that you're not you would not presently be doing apart from his power. And if there isn't anything, just tell him that. And maybe there's a part, a place in your life where you're quenching the Holy Spirit. You know it. You're, you have an idol. You've got something else that you love more than you love Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is just dying because he wants to breathe new life into you. He wants to give you the grace you need to break that addiction, break that habit, to be the type of person that he's calling you to. And maybe some of you, maybe some of you have never repented of your sin, of your control over your life. You've never said yes to Jesus. And today's the day. Some of you have never been baptized yet. See, all you need to do in order to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit is obey. Just follow Jesus. Just take a step of faith, trust, and obedience. And you too will receive the gift of the Spirit. So Jesus, with our hearts wide open, would you breathe on us again? Would you teach us to breathe and walk and live by your Spirit? Because we don't want our lives to be explainable. We want them to be extraordinary. We want them to only be explained and understood that there's a God in heaven 
who still breathes his spirit in us. And it changes everything. And we pray this, not just for us in this room, but our kids and grandkids. We want them to be filled with the very fullness of God and use us to teach them how to walk with you, keep in step with your spirit. We love you, commit ourselves to you. And we pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said,